Okay, thank you for joining us tonight for the third city-hosted meeting featuring presentations from our talented and committed development teams that have come from near and far to join us. And thank you, citizens, for your engagement in this very important process. My name is Sophia Sorolis. I'm the Director of Economic and Workforce Development for the City of St. Petersburg. I'll keep my comments short because we want to get right to the presentations. But as I was preparing for tonight, I wanted to highlight five of the 21 guiding principles that have been referred to over and over that will inform our consideration of these proposals. The first one that I picked was the development will be a public-private collaboration that incorporates the goals of the city, which have been informed by the community. The development will honor the site's history and provide opportunities for economic equity and inclusion. The development will provide jobs, entertainment, mixed income housing, family-oriented spaces that provide economic development for the surrounding community. The development will celebrate and enhance cultural diversity and authenticity of the city, and the development will connect to South St. Petersburg physically, economically, and emotionally. The city and the community together have been working on this process for over six years. I'm not going to take you through every uh, meeting and plan document, but we created two master, uh, conceptual master plan development scenarios, one keeping the stadium, one without. We've performed a smart city sustainability and healthy community plan targeted at the property's redevelopment. We have uh, teams from both um, the uh, St. Petersburg EDC and the downtown partnership that have been meeting. Duke Energy provided a site readiness program to assess how the site um, could be uh, redeveloped using um, their utilities. And we, uh, the city and the com has community and community participation in the Bloomberg Harvard Cross Boundary Collaboration Program. Um, just some ground rules for tonight. We're going to give each presentation team 15 minutes to present their proposal, and then we'll have a one-hour question and answer session. You can submit a question at any point in the meeting. Um, there's question boxes in the back, and there'll be a five-minute break between each presentation, and we'll. Uh, gather the cards and um, go through them. Um, you can also submit questions digitally using a Slido app, sli.do.com, and login information is in the back. Um, Trevor Pettiford from Bay News 9 um, will select the questions and moderate the Q&A portion of tonight's meeting, which will last one hour. Development teams will be given equal time to respond to the questions in an effort to make the Q&A as fair as possible, and we're keeping time for each portion of the meeting. Now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Rick Kreisman, Mayor of the City of St. Petersburg. Thank you, Sophia. Good evening, everyone. Well, let me uh, first apologize to those of you who've been to any of the previous meetings we've had, and certainly uh, to the teams, because the comments that I'm going to give in just a minute are, are ones that I've given the last couple nights, and quite frankly, the reason I'm repeating them again tonight is because I think they're pretty important. Uh, so again, my apologies if you're hearing this for the second or third time, but l let me first thank all the teams for being here, thank all of you for being here tonight, and for our city team uh, for their efforts at making tonight and this week possible. Now, this isn't the first time that we've engaged the public related to the Tropicana Field site. Public engagement goes back many years, including the master planning process that occurred during my first term as mayor. And this also isn't the last time that we'll engage with the public on this site. You see, this site has a long, deep history in this city. Many promises were made, promises which remain unfulfilled. And it's because of the history and unkept promises that the public, our residents, our business owners, and any other interested stakeholders must be involved every step of the way until the last ribbon is cut on this site. Now, the elected officials in St. Pete and in Pinellas County, we represent you, the people. We do not represent the developers. We don't represent the Tampa Bay Rays or any un, anyone else who might be looking to do something that isn't aligned with the pursuit of our brightest future. We are committed to ensure that the mistakes made in the past are not repeated. 
Our vision statement is clear. It says we will honor our past as we pursue our future. And that is the goal here. We must do right by those who came before us, and we must do right by the next generation. Now, we have four development teams who understand our vision, and they have poured a lot of time, energy, and money into their proposals. I am grateful for their interest and for their partnerships with local leaders and businesses. You see, St. Petersburg is a city on the rise, and these final four, these serious developers who come to us from across the country, each recognize that they won't succeed without community leaders at the table, without this being a people-powered process. They also recognize that they must be flexible enough to accommodate the existing stadium and baseball team, along with redeveloping this site with or without a new stadium. Now, given that this is a generational endeavor, that it will take many years, perhaps 10, 20 years, for this site to be fully developed, the uncertainty related to the Rays is not an obstacle. In the city of St. Petersburg, these development teams are residents. All want to move forward and begin this process that will ultimately lead to jobs, to housing, green space, along with so many other exciting opportunities. Again, this is a generational project. Many mayors, many council members will come and go before redevelopment is complete. But we must start somewhere. I am getting tired of looking at a desert of concrete in the middle of our downtown. I want to see activity. I want to see opportunity for the residents of this community. And so tonight is about listening and learning and asking questions and learning again. Most importantly, we want your feedback. We need your feedback, please. So I want to thank you all again for being engaged. Thank you to the teams that are here. And thank you guys so much for helping the sun to shine so brightly on us here in the burn. Enjoy the night. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And let's have our first team. Uh, team one tonight is Sugar Hill Community Partners, JMA Ventures, David Carlock, founder and president of the Machete Group. Come on down. I go on here. But. All right, we're on the clock. Uh, my name is David Carlock. I'm the project manager for the Sugar Hill team. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Mayor Kreisman, Dr. Tomlin, if you're here, other electeds. We appreciate very much your vision for the project. And again, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about our proposal. We believe strongly, as I know many others do, that uh, the future of the TROP cannot be realized without acknowledging the past. In fact, we're going to talk a lot about the future of the TROP tonight, as well we should, but we want to emphasize how important it is to stay connected to the history and to the historical context. We've done a lot of work to make sure that we understand and appreciate that, and I want to emphasize it's just the beginning. There's, there's much more to learn uh, and it's an important part of how we're approaching this project. And we think that Quincy pretty much has it right. That, that summarizes the way that we're approaching that piece of this uh, development. Let's move to the next uh, slide. And the other thing I'll mention briefly before we jump into this is that we've met now with close to 100 folks in the community, uh, educators, public officials, entrepreneurs, uh, researchers, and we just want to thank everybody for being so generous with their insight and with their time, again, that's just the first step. We look forward to continuing those conversations and we welcome anybody who'd like to come and talk to us about our vision for the TROP to do that. So we're gonna hit three things with our time uh, this evening. We're gonna talk briefly about our team. Uh, Michael Sorensen is gonna talk about our design vision for the project. And then we're gonna cover a few elements of our community benefits plan. We'd love to cover all of them. We don't quite have enough time, uh, but we would welcome anyone who has additional questions to come by our booth 
or uh, look us up and we'll indicate how that, uh, how that works and how you can make that happen. So here's our team. Uh, Brady Bunch on steroids, I guess, inspired us. Uh, the yellow, uh, excuse me, the orange stripes underneath the images uh, indicate folks who are local. We feel like that's, uh, that's a lot of orange, and I want to emphasize that these are your neighbors. You might go to the same church or temple that they do. You might run to them at the supermarket. Uh, you might see them uh, jogging out by the pier, but the important part is to make sure that we have a significant part of our team that's anchored in St. Pete. That's a unique perspective and sense of caring about where this project goes that they bring to the table. So let's talk about who's up on stage with us this evening. Todd Chapman is here. Todd is the uh, president of JMA Ventures, which is our lead developer. Kevin Johnson, uh, former mayor of Sacramento, uh, is also here. He's uh, an executive with JMA. Michael Sorensen, I mentioned earlier, is with Henning Larson. Henning Larson is our planning architect. They're one of the leaders in the field. Ernie DuBose is the president and founder of Ducon Construction, local contractor. Uh, Sarah Jane Vadalo is with the local uh, architectural firm Bahar. Uh, they're involved with the um, Holocaust uh, Museum as well as a number, number of other projects. Linda Nunley is here from Moody Nolan. Moody Nolan is the largest African-American owned architectural firm in the country. Also the recipient of the AIAA Firm of the Year uh, Award last year. So we're thrilled to have them as part of the team. Scott McDonald from Blue Sky Communities. Blue Sky is our affordable housing partner. You'll hear more from Scott in a few minutes. Barbara Wilkes at W uh, spearheaded the uh, design of the approach at St. Petersburg Pier. Uh, Adam Carnegie is an urban planner with Stantec, an engineering firm here in town. And then Thomas Huggins at Ariel will oversee all of our diversity and, inclu and inclusion efforts over the life of the project. And I want to emphasize that, not just the beginning of the project, but throughout the duration of the project. So this is a, a big project, uh, and that's going to take uh, a developer who has experience uh, doing similar kinds of um, undertakings. So we've put about $10 billion worth of capital to work successfully, and about $700 million of that has been here in St. Petersburg. We're also very familiar with sports, so we don't know exactly where the Rays will end up. Mayor Kreisman alluded to this a couple of minutes ago. We're certainly uh, hopeful uh, in a variety of different respects. I think the important thing here is that we're, we're very familiar with what it takes to successfully deliver a stadium and to successfully deliver a mixed-use uh, community or development around it. Our projects include Chase Center in San Francisco, home of the Warriors, uh, FC Cincinnati's uh, new soccer stadium, uh, and City Field, which is home of the uh, New York Mets, baseball's New York Mets. We've also delivered 1,700 affordable and workforce housing units with another 1,100 and change in development currently. So I'll turn things over to uh, Michael. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. So uh, the world-renowned Danish urbanist Jan Gill, he once said that the cities should be designed for homo sapiens. And what he meant was that they should be designed for people and they should be experienced by, on foot. And when you think about that, you have to think about the scale of cities, the scale of the buildings you build, the scale of the urban spaces you create, your streets, your parks, they all come together to create communities that foster people engagement. Next, please. We know from some of the greatest cities in the world that they do exactly this. They are accommodating, they are walkable, they are of their place. They are really something unique. They foster creativity, they foster community, and they foster opportunity. Next, please. And what's been so inspiring about being in, in, uh, in, in St. Pete is that it's, it does exactly that. It's in a hugely vibrant city. It has a fantastic climate. It has an arts and cultural scene that is second to none. And really, I think what you have going here in St. Pete is on par with what you have in some of the best cities uh, in the world. And it's important that we want to take all of these, these, this, this vibrancy that's already going on in St. Pete and adopt that and bring that into the Tropicana site and make it accessible, affordable, and an invitation to everyone. Next, please. Our design vision is de uh, defined by four themes. Reconnecting, rebuilding, and remembering. Connecting through nature. Extending the human scale of downtown and bringing it into the site and creating landmark civic spaces. These four themes aren't, aren't only visions, but they're physical elements that tie the design together and connect people. Next, please. Our proposal starts by reconnecting the site and, 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 and tying it back to downtown. 
and, and at the same time celebrating the history and culture and the experiences that made this neighborhood such a thriving neighborhood many years ago. What you see on the screen is a history walk. You can see it on our model over here. It's a diagonal cut through the site that joins, the, that ties the downtown in the northeast corner to the southern part of, of, of St. Pete in the southwestern corner. It's filled with local art and memorials to celebrate the rich history of the site. And you can see that it starts, the identity of, the, the, the identity of it is human scaled, it's active, it's inviting, and it's vibrant. Bringing people together in nature provides profound impacts on human health and community wellness. While we will incorporate nature throughout the plan, the existing Booker Creek provides the biggest opportunity for restoring a complete ecology and providing a place for community gathering and engagement. And we know this could be done because we've done it before. Our team has restored over a thousand miles of streams and from this experience, we understand that nature is dynamic. Our design includes nested channels that accommodate low flows and, and high waters. We will continue to refine Booker Creek Park with your input, as well as input from scientists and other specialists. Please come visit us at our table and give us your ideas and comments. Thanks, Barbara. So we are proposing a diverse mix is this on? We are proposing a diverse mix of program on the site to bring jobs, homes, and activity to St. Pete. We have an innovation campus that sits in Booker Creek, very near to the innovation district. We have a 1.3 million square foot convention center combined with a performance center that creates a new link to the southern part of, 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 of St. Pete. We have a robust housing scheme that we'll talk about later. And we also look forward to engaging in dialogue with the Rays to make their new stadium or their new home an important link from the site and back to the city. Thanks, please. Here you're looking on the, from the western edge of the history walk. You're looking back towards the city. You're under the canopy of the conference center. Uh, this is a great place. It's shaded. It's perfect for gatherings, events, markets, small concert theaters. It can easily combine with an arts performance center where you have arts, uh, arts like art galleries, performance spaces, teaching facilities, and again, creating a vibrancy that connects the area back to downtown. Next. And finally, we were, we were asked to look at two schemes, one scheme with a stadium and one scheme without a stadium. They both built on the same vision. That vision is to create an identity for the site that is quite unique, but also tie the site back to the surrounding neighborhoods and back to the city. Booker Creek is a very central piece of that. And you can see that the, the uh, diagonal cut that connects the city from the northeastern corner to the southwestern corner becomes an important element uh, in the future scheme as well. Uh, I'd like to hand it over to David to talk about the rest. Yeah. Next slide, please. Thank you, Michael. Oh, back one. There we go. Okay. So as I mentioned, we'd love to talk briefly about some of the key elements of our community benefits plan. I also want to emphasize, I indicated earlier, we would love to talk for a lot more time about all of the elements in our plan. I encourage you to look at our response. I encourage you to come see us. I encourage you to visit us in developer hours. And we'll talk about that again in a minute. So 30,000 jobs, that's a big number. This is a big project. The key here is making sure that as many local residents, as many uh, members of the South St. Pete community are prepared to successfully apply for and perform those jobs. 30,000 jobs that uh, are filled by, other, by others from people outside the community, that's not delivering the kind of benefit that we believe in. One of the things I want to emphasize about our team is that we're already doing the work to make sure we understand how to implement those kinds of programs. So Mike Ramsey, who's the head of workforce development at St. Petersburg College, is someone who's already partnered with us, working with Gulf Coast ABC. Uh, Ernie is involved with uh, his group. So we're starting to build the programs, the job training uh, efforts, and the pipeline that, we can, uh, that is necessary to deliver jobs to people here in St. Pete as the project goes forward. I also want to emphasize, we're not just talking about construction jobs. We're committed to workforce development across the entire scope of the project. That's design, development, construction, operation. So Ernie, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. I'm excited to uh, spend a quick minute to talk to you about our diversity inclusion program. Um, again, we know that to have an effective program, you've got to have true inclusion and outreach that prepares uh, the, the small woman and minority-owned businesses, prepares them for success in partnerships. One thing we have beyond that is passion, 
purpose, and the right people. With Ariel Consulting, one of the largest, most success, successful business uh, minority consultants in the state, have been on some of the largest projects. And with us as a general contractor, minority-owned general contractor, uh, we know how to implement, uh, a, a implement and, and uh, successfully complete an inclusion program. Number one, it starts at the top. Being at the table, at the developer level, the contracting level, that's the first way we do it. We create partnerships. Three-minute warning. Dukon is currently on $300 million worth of projects in the Bay Area through these partnerships. That's created jobs for minority-owned women, uh, minority-owned uh, businesses in the region. So again, we've, we've uh, as the slide says, we've been responsible for over 20% of all contracts in the past six years have gone to small women and minority-owned businesses. And then simply in the last 12 months, we have allocated over $20 million in contracts to minority-owned minority businesses in the Bay Area. So we're happy to implement it. We're looking at raising the bar um, on the TROP project, and we're, we look forward to your questions. Uh, good evening. My name is Scott McDonald. I'm the Executive Vice President and CFO of Blue Sky Communities. I'm also a resident of the City of St. Petersburg and the ca uh, Chair of our Affordable Housing Advisory Committee here. The other key members of the Affordable Housing team are my partner, Sean Wilson, and community leaders, Roy Binger and Reverend Lewis Murphy. Blue Sky Communities brings uh, a unique aspect uh, to our plan. We're a local affordable housing developer. We've developed three projects in the city of St. Petersburg to date, and we have a fourth under construction in the Skyward Marina District right now. Perhaps more important is that uh, we have a local uh, property management company. And together, we are committed, along with Sugar Hill Community Partners, to creating a seamless mixed income neighborhood. You'll find that 35% of our units will be committed to residents making less than 80% of AMI. An additional 10% will be between 80% and 120% of AMI. That's a, a large spectrum, but it's approximately $15,000 per year or $400 per month, all the way up to, say, $75,000 or, or $1,500 per month. Additionally, we'll have 100 for sale condo units. I'd like to turn it back to David now. Thank you. So We'll close quickly here. Uh, as I indicated earlier, the, the meetings we've had, the discussion we've had so far have just been the beginning. We want to invite everybody to come and talk to us, your hopes, your concerns, your questions about what we think the TROP can be. That's why we've established something we call uh, developer hours. Every Thursday from 2 to 4, a senior member of our team will be available via Zoom. We'd normally do these in person, but given that we're not quite out of the woods on the pandemic yet, uh, we're going to make it available on those terms. And uh, we, we wanted to emphasize what we view as our promise to the community. Um, I don't like reading when I present, but I want to make sure we emphasize this. We view ourselves and will be and are committed to be reliable partners to the city, the community. We're going to work to ensure this project becomes a reflection of St. Petersburg's history, a vision of its future, and most importantly, fulfillment of its promise, a long-held promise, as Mayor Kreisman indicated, as an engine of opportunity, creativity, and inspiration for all residents. Thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure to introduce Unicorp National Development, Chuck Woodall, Master Developer and President of Unicorp National Developments. Good evening. Are we on? Good evening, everybody. I'm Chuck Woodall with Unicorp National Developments. Uh, Mayor, thank you for this opportunity, council members, and uh, most of all, thank you all for taking the time in your community to come out tonight to hear all of our proposals. Uh, it's very exciting to, to be part of this, and uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our company in a moment, but first, uh, I want Lashante to come up and speak. All right, well, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, my name is Lashante Keys, and I'm going to be working with Unicorp through inclusivity. And inclusivity focuses on cultural competence within, the organ within every organization within the city. And so what my responsibility is, and what our responsibility is as inclusivity, is to make sure that we hold Unicorp accountable for the past, but then also hold them accountable for what's going to happen in the future. We're very, very excited about what this can bring to us. What brought me back to St. Pete? 
was a tragedy that I thought was happening in my city. A tragedy that happened in 96 when the riots happened. And that's what brought me back because I felt like there's something that needed to be done within the city. And so from there I came back and I started working for the National Conference for Community and Justice. And so my work in the community has been paid and non-paid. My work in the community has been just that, the work in the community to assure that this St. Petersburg, my home, St. Petersburg, St. Pete, the Berg, whatever you want to call it, to make sure that we are a better place and a better society. What Unicorp will bring to this community will be more understanding. Unicorp would also bring more jobs to this organization. Unicorp would also bring the equity that needs to be done for this community. And that's the most important thing is equity. We want to ensure that everybody has an opportunity. And how do we make sure that everybody has an opportunity? You got to make sure that everybody's at the table. So with that, we're also planning for a community engagement. We'll be developing a coalition. And the coalition will have everybody represented at that table. Every neighborhood association, every fraternity, every sorority, every, everybody that you can think of would be at that table. Why? Because the African American community is not a monolithic community. It is not just one voice that can speak for everybody. It is a group of individuals who make up this community. And in addition to that, we'll also, including equity, we'll also be working with the ADA because we want to make sure that the people that we're building this for, the people that we're representing, if I am building this for my grandparents and they can't get around because there's no accommodations for the Americans with disabilities, if there's no accommodations, then what's the purpose? So we're looking at equity from a, from a, a big, big lens, not just through ethnicity, but we're also do, looking at it through the Disability Act as well. And so with that, I think Chuck is going to give you some more information about what we plan to do. But again, I am a son of St. Pete. I'm a third generation St. Petersburg, St. Petersburgian, and I want to make sure that what we do in this, in, in this city continues for, for a legacy to move on. Thank you, Lashante. So we have a great team of people here. I'm not going to introduce everybody, but everybody is from around here. They're all locals. I was born and raised in Central Florida. My father was a fireman. I started my business with nothing, and I've been in business 23 years, and we've completed or completing about $5 billion worth of different developments. We redeveloped the Naval Training Center in Orlando, Florida, and turned it into uh, Baldwin Park, developed a beautiful downtown. We did the largest uh, development town center in uh, Virginia called West Broad Village. So we've got a lot of experience. Um, we've never had a project not completed. And we're very passionate. I don't read from a script. I like to talk about what we're doing. But I'm very passionate about this business. I love it. And this is a great opportunity for us. And we're excited. So I want to look back at the past a little bit. This is an image that you're looking at of the original neighborhood that was on the site that we're looking at today. And it was a community, and I always refer to what we're doing as building a community. I really try not to look at this as a development project, we're all developers, but truly we've got a unique opportunity that we can set an example for the entire nation how we can bring a community back together and recreate the community. And what's interesting in this is if you look at all the blue area, that was the public open space. And there were 33 acres of open space in the original development. This was a proposal a long time ago when it was going to be redeveloped by the city of St. Petersburg, and it has 23 acres of green space. And what's interesting is we're a mixed-use developer. We build apartments, we build single-family homes, we build hotels, we build offices. We do all classes of developments because it helps us better understand what we're doing. So when I look back at uh, what was there, there was some grocery stores there, beauty salon, barber shops game rooms, cleaners, uh, liquor store, roofing. There were all sorts of different businesses. And that's what we do as a company, is we build lifestyle centers. We, when I started off in my career into development, I was, um, <laughs> I'm annoyed because my phone is ringing in my pocket. Sorry, I was distracted. Uh, so when I started off the company, we were um, not trying to compete with the mall guys. There was a bunch of big mall guys. And so we thought, well, let's build a business that is built around neighborhood type things, community uses. And that's what we've built our entire company on. And we've done successfully over 100 different developments. So when we look at uh, the opportunity we have today, and you'll see another image in a moment, we really wanted to, to create a big park in the middle. I told you the original development that was there had 33 acres. We have 37 acres of park 
People will use the term open space. The difference in what we have is we actually have park area of 37 acres. We have a roller skating rink in the middle of it. We have um, an aviary for birds. We have plenty of places to kick ball and uh, for people to go out and have picnics and do different things. We think the park is very, very instrumental in bringing the community together. The park's not going to discriminate on race, color, anything. It's where everybody can get together and play and have fun. And I'm going to let my architect, Bernard, talk about that for a minute. Thank you, Chuck. Good evening, St. Petersburg. It's really a pleasure for us to be here. Um, there's really a lot more information for any of our teams to communicate in 15 minutes. Uh, so let me just hit some of the highlights that I think haven't yet been addressed adequately uh, by our team. Um, as Chuck mentioned, we have 36 acres of park, uh, but the, the idea of the park is to make a walkable community. Uh, we agree totally with the mayor. It's time to get rid of the parking lot, the hot heat island that is there. And we want to create a really uh, exciting and, and, and uh, active community. But the idea of scale has come up in, in, in many conversations. And I know at our table that has been a conversation. So I want to emphasize a couple of thoughts about that. One is that when the city put out the proposal, uh, they put out a maximum amount of density. Uh, Chuck and the team decided that we would make our proposal less than that. We think that what's really important is for this area to not only be revitalized, but to be a catalyst for all of the adjacent neighborhoods, the edge, the warehouse, the innovation. And if you build a project that is maximized at the center, that's going to put a lot of real estate pressure on all of the adjacent neighborhoods. We want to blend in with the neighborhood and not stick out uh, as a completely out of scale project. So if we go to the next slide, we can begin, I'm sorry, Chuck, go back. Um, you can see that what we've done is, like everyone else, we've paid a lot of attention to Booker Creek. We've paid a lot of attention to the park. We have our ties in to Campbell. We're even proposing, if you look at our project carefully, the removal of the ramps at I-175 so that we can continue the park all the way down to 4th Street because those ramps are redundant. You don't need them if you have all the frontage roads. Uh, so we think we could use this project not only for its own sake, but also for the sake of becoming a catalyst for all of the adjacent neighborhoods to set a good example of the appropriate scale that makes things walkable and developable so that everyone in the surrounding area uh, really has an opportunity to grow as well. Um, we also want to talk to you a little bit about our program. We have innovation centers. We have what we call flexible uh, units, both in housing and in commercial. So if you think about a startup, they need very little space. Uh, Chuck and Unicorp has already said they have a financial program to help the startups. But that also needs to be accompanied by the appropriate architectural solutions. So we have what we call flexible space space for small companies to share the same building with large companies so that there's a mentorship and there's an integration that happens through the finance and economics. And as we all know, a lot of really important stuff happens when we meet each other on the street downstairs. So we could talk about this for a long time. We have a very large number of features in our project. But I know that uh, we want to leave time for Chuck and the rest of the team to explain a lot of the other features. So thank you. Oh, he says, tell me about the Manta Ray. Uh, we were thinking that um, the location of the stadium where the highway is, is merging is really the best spot. And we face it east because one of the rules of MLB, Major League Baseball, is when you're at home plate, you need to face east. So the, the stadium is set up correctly. It's got um, all four sides appropriately done. And as architects, one of the little things we like to do is to, since we spend so many hours drawing, uh, put a little fun into the project. So we thought, why don't we make the stadium roof the shape of a manta ray uh, and, and really make it an iconic feature for, for the city? Um, I think it's a lot of fun. I think it could be um, a really strong uh, feature for everyone, um, and we're happy Chuck likes it. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. Um, I'd like to point out, um, 
everybody's got great plans. We've watched uh, all the developers' presentations. Ours does have less density, and we did that on purpose because we wanted to have the great park that we think is just so essential for this community. I, I think it just really makes the community. We have one third of our housing is workforce or affordable housing, one third workforce, and then we have market and luxury housing along with office. And we've even got a letter of intent already from Marriott to do a 400 room hotel and a convention center. So we're excited about that. We have a relationship with Marriott. We have two developments going with them right now and um, we come and bring them to the table. So there is a look at what it would look like. And you can see all of our buildings, it, it looks like it's already been there. We, we didn't create all high rises going all across the development. And at the end of the day, if, if, if we're told by the city or the community that we need more density, we can certainly do it. But it just feels right. It looks right. It feels right. It doesn't look like it was built all at one time. It's got the character you would like to see in a great city. We've got the roller skating rink you can see in the upper part of the park. We've got water features and we've got plenty of places just to gather and have picnics. So last night I was um, going to bed and I was trying morning. to think about why should the city of St. Petersburg choose us? Because we're all good developers. Why should they choose us? I think the one thing that sets us apart, Unicorp, from the other developers, I started this company, I got into business when I was 12 years old. There's an old saying, you can't teach hungry. I was hungry. I built a business, I work every day. When there's a phone call to be taken, you see I have my phone on me. I answer my telephone. And for the startup businesses here and to incubate businesses, we do this every day of the week. We work with small businesses. We read their business plans. We help small businesses. We know what it's like not to have money and to want to start a business, and we know how to do it and how to grow a business. During the pandemic, during COVID, and I don't know if anybody else can say this, we've got over 500 tenants who rent space from us in retail centers. We not only gave them free rent, we didn't make them pay it back. We did not evict one single tenant during the whole entire COVID pandemic because we have relationships with them. You know, I talk to the smallest tenants to the largest tenants and we work with them. It's important because for them to survive is how we survive. And it truly is a partnership. It's not just a landlord trying to make money off a tenant. I do these things because I have a passion for it. I love it. I love being around people. And I know that we can make a lot of great local businesses here succeed and thrive. And we're excited to do this in your community. So. Um, Afterward, love to talk to anybody about it, but I hope we're choosing for it. We're excited about it, and thank you all for having us tonight. We're going to take a five-minute break. Feel free to drop off your questions at the question box or use the Slido app to submit a question. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the Team 3 Midtown Development Creekside, Alex Vidia, Midtown Development. Hi, my name is Alex Vidia, um, Principal of Midtown Development. I'm very excited and honored to be here. Um, just to tell you a little bit about us, we are Investors that develop, and our proposal, I see, I think highlights that. We're just a little bit about our project. This was taken a week ago. Um, this is one of our projects. It's Midtown Miami, which is a 56-acre project in Miami. Um, who we are is what we've done. We build neighborhoods. We, it's simple. We align ourselves with the neighborhood, and we grow with the neighborhood. We invest in the neighborhood and grow together. For us, here's kind of our commitment, here is our commitment. We're offering 60 million of all the groups with the highest purchase price to purchase the property. We are also capping the city exposure to $75 million, meaning if there's any cost overruns above that, we are guaranteeing them. So we're asking $75 million in the TIF and not a dollar more. Our commitment is $185 million. A little bit about Midtown, um, it's extremely, we focus, I would say 80% of our effort into what happens 
on the ground floor. And it's not really the architecture. You know, you can get ugly places. It's what happens inside and the life that goes inside. And the, the trick is the balance of how to keep it local. And we do bring very few national tenants. And the national tenants are there to serve as one purpose, to highlight and to help the local tenants. The idea of this project, it's, I think, if you were to simplify it, is give someone that lives in Water Street, Tampa, give them a reason to come here. One thing that we do is we activate the lots before, as we're developing it. We did 400,000 square feet of, of art space with Art Miami. This brought over 150,000 people to our project in a matter of four days. We propose to do that in the next 365 days to kick off the project without having to wait to build buildings. Here we have a rendering showing Art St. Pete. Um, the first time I came to this city, I was probably eight years old, 10 years old, and the reason why I came was for the arts. And I've stayed here for multiple reasons why, and it's hard to pinpoint one specific reason. It's, it's got so many things going for it. Here's another example of a pop-up retail that we would start even before we start building the first building. We've, part of my job is not only to, to fund the project, it's also to, to pick the team. The team is very important. Um, we've got a good mix of local and national tenants. Um, we, reached, we met Watson. Um, if, if anyone ever has met him, will know why we decided to partner with him. And the Pinellas County Urban League will be part in, in, of the decision in every aspect of this project. A little bit more highlights of some team members, both local and national. And then we started this process with a plan. We wanted to hire the best planner. We interviewed north of 15 planners, and we kept going back to Randy that was here from day one. He was the planner that the city had hired to design. So in that note, I'll hand it off to him. Great. Th thanks so much, Alex. And hi, everybody. My name is Randy Morton. I'm, I'm an architect and urban designer. And we're going to do something a little different tonight on our third presentation. The first night, we showed you a lot of detail about ideas. Last night, we spent time talking about affordability and culture in the arts. And tonight, we're going to pull back the curtain a little bit. And we want you to understand how we think about things and how we're going to work on this project and how we're going to take ideas like this that look like they're cast in stone, but these are really conceptual thoughts and how we think versatilely about things. We get all of our design information really from two simple buckets. The first bucket is called the community desires. That's all the conversations that we have with everybody and all the community groups and everything that everybody dreams the future could be. There's another bucket that I'm calling the lay of the land, which is what's happening on the ground. There are technical issues about toxic soils. There are flow issues with the creek. There are traffic issues. There are pieces there. So I'm going to talk about the lay of the land, and then I'm going to turn it over to Michael, who's going to show you how the community desires lend in, lean into this. And I'm going to start with the just the influence of the neighborhoods, the lay of the land and what's on the ground and the way all of those neighborhoods have parted influence on the TROP site. But what I want to do in this unusual looking drawing is just focus your attention on one neighborhood just called your waterfront, because I'm sure you all know it. You know it's special. And then we'll compare it to the TROP. And when what we've learned from the waterfront, what we've learned about a lot of special places is you see those red lines on there. That's the city grid. That's man-made. That's rational. That's put in place to help divide up land for real estate purposes, to design efficient buildings. And then you see that crazy blue line that has a mind of its own. That's where the land and the water meet. That is the most expressive line in the city. And it's that kind of expression and specialness that we're looking for when we try and understand what does the lay of the land want to tell us about a place. So when we move inland and we get to the TROP, we see the same idea about a grid being very rational. And then we see Booker Creek, and you see it has its own geometry. It's not parallel to the city streets. It's doing its own thing. So if you're like us and you believe in Booker Creek, you create an entire plan around that new geometry. And suddenly, when you're in here at the TROP, 
you're in an environment that you can't find anywhere else in St. Pete, the same way you don't find anything like you do when you're on your waterfront. And it just comes from understanding the things that are there. So our sketch plan, you're not going to see fancy, tight computer drawings tonight, just simple sketch drawings. And this sketch plan, the ingredients in all of urban design come down to three simple pieces, parks, streets, and blocks. That's how you make cities all around the world. And you look at this sketch right here, and when we're done, go look at the, put your sunglasses on, but go look at the model over there that's shining brightly, and you'll see what that looks like. But let me go into a little detail about a park system. We have a lot of flexibility in the way we can lay out our park system. And on this sketch, you can see how the park system is deferring to the angle of Booker Creek. So when you're on the trop site in the future, you're going to be in a completely different kind of an environment than when you leave any of the other neighborhoods. So it's going to be special because everything's going to be in a different direction. The thing about our street system is that once you defer to the creek, we have a number of choices, but you see how the streets turn. In this instance, the streets are short. You notice they don't go all the way through. You can't drive your car all the way through this project because we don't want people to drive their car all the way through to this project. They can drive through on 1st. They can drive through on 175. They can drive through on 16th. But when you're here, you drive, you get to your destination, and in the middle around the creek, there's an idea about an auto-free zone. We can control that, and we can let it be a place for pedestrians first because of the way we bend the grid and the way we align our streets. If we need to, we can actually add some streets so we can cross the creek more. We have a lot of flexibility in the way we can adjust our streets. We talked a lot about other things that make St. Pete special, like the diversity of neighborhoods. And this little photo essay just takes four of the many. And you can see visually how different they all are. And it's the differences that are really important to us. So the last piece in putting a city together are the blocks. So in between all the streets and in between those parks, these pink shapes are the blocks. This is where all the buildings go. So when you go look at the model, you'll see all the brightly lit buildings. This is a pattern, if you notice, that all blocks are different. You notice how the blocks bend. Almost every block is a different shape. You don't have to spend time counting them, but we're adding about 30 new city blocks. And you see the different shapes of the, of the blocks, and some are for affordable housing. Some are for office buildings. Some are for cultural and commercial buildings. There are retail plans. And they also don't all get built at once. They get built over time. There's also special blocks. Like take the block that's right in the middle, where on one side it's on the terraces of the creek in Central Park. What fun is it going to be to talk about what we put in that building, whether it's an educational building or a really tall building or no building at all in just a park? So this is how we begin to adjust our plans. If we take the trop where it sits today and we put it on the plan, this is where it would be. And those blocks on the right, let's say for the time being, that's going to be our first phase. So we can build a first phase. We can let the trop operate as it is today in full. All the parking will be there. All the operations will be there. And for the very first time, the trop as it is today, it will be part of something larger. So remember that as we move on. So even the existing TROP, before we even talk about baseball or not, has an influence. So if we now take all those and we talk about a, a plan for base, a, without baseball, no ballpark, I want to show you another sketch. That big block up there, one of many ways we can create a block for a baseball park. Here's, a, here's one way to think about that baseball park. And in sort of deference to the Rays, what we're not doing is we're not putting forth a design for their stadium, but we're giving them a place in the plan that's a proper size. So if you look at that block, it's on the corner of 16th and 1st. That's a really cool address. And if you look on the right-hand side of that block, the baseball park would be part of the scene of the new creek. And if you look on the bottom part of the south, the baseball park would be part of the new greenway. So this is how we would work with the Rays. They'll do whatever they need to do with their stadium, roof, no roof, any, however many seats. It's all their business. And then they will be part of a larger vision. So whether we have, whether we have no baseball stadium or whether we have a baseball stadium, we feel like we can deliver the kind of St. Pete future that everybody's been asking about. So when we get into streets and parks, this, this piece right here, I just want to go to the very end. Here's basically what the model would look like. 
And what I want to do is turn it over to Michael now so he can tell you about the community participation. Thank you, Andy. Oh, I'm very loud. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael DiGregorio. I'm a landscape architect with uh, Hood Design Studio in Oakland, California. And we're a studio that focuses on landscape architecture, public art, and urbanism. And we've actually worked with a lot of communities like yours throughout the country. Uh, our founder, Walter Hood, has spent his career focusing on the idea of or the topic of race in the landscape, and, and not just the landscape of parks and gardens in our cities, but the city overall. And unfortunately, what we know is that uh, the story that the folks in this community have experienced is not unique in the United States. Three minute uh, warning. And so we've had the opportunity to develop plans uh, of how to bring new public space into cities that have experienced these similar things. And the way that we like to introduce that is through this idea of reading the cultural landscape. And these are elements that are there today or were once there. And how can we exhume them or how can we express them stronger if they're already there? We know that there is a, a vast amount of communities surrounding the TROP site. And how do we integrate them into the site? So we want to think about this from the outside in. And so in tracing this cultural landscape, we look at some of these linear elements, the Heritage Trail, the Pinellas Trail, Booker Creek. And looking from the outside in, how do we take what's already there and bring it into the site? Start there first. And think about then how it integrates with the open space network within our site, but now within the greater neighborhoods. Within the site, this is our first pass. This is an idea of a large 36-acre site with the vast opportunities for scales and types of open spaces. This is just an idea of what we had to start, but I think the point about this is that this is when we start talking to you and say, what exactly would you like to see here? As I've said, we've done this uh, a lot, and we've done this with a lot of different communities, and for us, um, we don't look at community engagement as something that's a requirement. Um, we get really excited about it. And so there's a lot of great ways that we've done it, and we'd like to do some of them here. One thing that's universal is food, and so always having food, good music. This, this starts to break the norm of a dark hall, everyone kind of writing their ideas on the wall. There's other ways to do it that we've done, bringing models for people to play with, maybe walking the Booker Creek with the community. We look at community engagement, Alex mentioned Art St. Pete's. So these early wins or early interventions can be the stages for community engagement. And, and so this is something we've done in uh, Opelaka uh, outside of Miami. And in Philadelphia, how to start thinking about how to activate some of their alleys. We actually built tables and chairs with the community and had this really long uh, series of, of meals with, with the entire community. Also in Philadelphia, uh, this site was a, a eventually developed as a Highline-esque park, but before it got there, how do we start to bring attention to these places? So these are things that we'd like to work with the community on and bring them into the site. We know that this is hard to trust people initially, but we're here to take that first step with you. We're really excited about this opportunity um, as a team, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Our, our last uh, team tonight, last but not least, Portman Holdings and Third Lake Partners. Ken Jones, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Third Lake Partners. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. I know that wasn't quite a five minute break, but I, we want to be as expeditious as we can and we'll give some time back to the house and, and to you all this evening. But thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Ken Jones. Um, I live here in Tampa Bay. I've lived here since I was five years old. I moved here in 1976. Um, I had a little stint in Washington, D.C., but other than that, I've been here my entire life. Um, and as I said, Chairman and CEO of Third Lake Partners, uh, we're going to introduce some folks from Portman Holdings. But tonight, we're going to go through the introduction of who we are, uh, what our community vision is for this site, uh, what our understanding of what that, that local engagement looks like and how we're going to engage the community as we go down the path. Uh, we're going to talk about our design vision, and then we're going to wrap it up and talk about how we will continue to engage all of the stakeholders in this community as we go forward. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Hunter Richardson from Portman Holdings. Hunter? Good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of brief background in terms of what we've done, because I want to spend more time on the, um, the plan itself. But 
Uh, we put together a partnership of Third Lake, Portman Holdings, and Portman Residential. Uh, between the three of us, we've done over $20 billion worth of real estate development. Uh, we've been in, um, the Portman Holdings side has been in the business since 1957. Uh, and so we have been at this for quite a while. Um, with that, we, um, we do offices, we do hotel, we do residential, entertainment, retail, and so forth. And so we basically cover all the product types that we would do, be doing here. Um, and in order to give it more of a local flavor, uh, and the um, Third Lake guys are lo local uh, to this marketplace, we also brought in Echelon. Uh, Echelon has been developing in St. Pete since 1982. Um, the most recent project is Caroline, but they've been here um, for, for an extended period of time. We also brought in uh, Piper Sandler uh, so that we would have the ability to deal with the public financing side. Uh, rather than give you the answer relative to what the public financing is, we need to know more what the project's going to be. Uh, but Piper Sandler is the third largest public financing uh, house in the U.S., and they've done over $20 billion worth of financing. Um, with that, uh, we also decided that we would build a team, and instead of just having one designer, we brought in, uh, actually we brought in four different teams for a, a charrette, uh, HKS, um, uh, Five Plus Design and uh, Bayer Blender Bell. We also brought in our in-house architects, Portman Architects, and so we basically used four different design groups trying to understand uh, St. Petersburg and what the opportunity was, uh, and we basically challenged them to give us ideas, and that's what we're going to share with you tonight, but it's, we're going to share with you one set of ideas and understanding that this is going to evolve as the community gets more involved in the process. Um, with that, we've uh, been doing urban development uh, since the 1960s. You know, as Atlanta was in a major state of decline, we went into inner city Atlanta, uh, did Peachtree Center, and so basically we've been catalytic in urban development. Um, and we've also worked in uh, San Francisco, uh, Salt Lake City, San Diego, um, Detroit, and so we basically have been around the country in terms of doing urban development. Um, and we basically um, live where we develop, and that basically the Third Lake guys are here, uh, Echelon is here, but all of our design teams basically are involved in their various communities. Uh, and we start off with community input, and with that I'm going to let Ken talk about this more as, as he's more familiar with the uh, Tampa St. Pete area. Thank you, Hunter. So we've only got we have 11 minutes left so so it's not 15 minutes is a very condensed condensed time frame to talk about all the content but i do think that i'm going to probably spend more than just a minute on this slide this is probably the most important slide we'll talk about tonight and we're still not going to get through everything so as you go through question and answer please ask lots of questions this should not be death by powerpoint for anybody this should be a two-way dialogue but really thinking about what came before us? You know, people say don't dwell on the past, but I think if you don't look at the past, it's hard to know where you are today and how you make progress into the future. And so if you look at what happened back in the 1970s and 80s when you had a thriving, thriving gas plant community in South St. Petersburg, I mean, I, I remember it, and not because I read about it, but because I, I was here. I remember coming down here as, as a grade schooler, at a middle schooler, and a high schooler, listening to the debate about baseball. And a lot of promises got made about what was going to happen if, in fact, they bulldozed a dozen black churches, 285 businesses, and more than 100 homes. And those promises got made, and none of those promises got kept. The one promise that did get kept was, we will build a ballpark. The ballpark got built. The baseball team eventually came after a couple of failed tries. And it has not been a success. The Rays have done very well. They got to the World Series this year, right? They got the lowest payroll of Major League Baseball, but that doesn't really soothe any of the wounds that happened to the community that was displaced to build that stadium. So as we look at all those neighborhoods, South St. Pete, Campbell Park, Melrose, Deuces Live, all those neighborhoods are now gone. And we think we have the ability to reconnect all those neighborhoods with this Tropicana redevelopment. So it, it would be completely presumptuous for me to stand up here tonight and bring one member of a particular group or one member of the community and say, Listen, we know best. We know we're going to tell you what we're going to do. That's not how this process works. The biggest, the biggest element to being world class, 
You talk to Bill Belichick about why, why Tom Brady is a world-class quarterback. It's not his ability. It's not his athletic skills. It's not his brains. I think he's got those things. But it is the ability to be coached. And if you do not have the ability to be coached and the ability to listen and take feedback and get better after you hear that feedback, you're, you're not going to be world-class. So this development will be world-class because we're going to listen to all of you. And so far, we've met with more than 500 people in the community. Some of our partners started this process back in 2016 in this very same ballroom that you're in tonight. We had community meetings with hundreds of people. We've met with more than two dozen pastors of churches right here in St. Petersburg within the last three months. And we've got endorsements from 10 of them from 10 African-American pastors in this community are endorsing our plan. And we'll talk more about that during the Q&A. Um, but, but it's so important that we have the ability to be coached and we're listening to you. Uh, next slide, please. The development stage and the operational stage. What are the things that we're going to do to engage the community? Well, it's got to start with job training and education. You have to engage people in the community with this project because it's not about just saying we created 500 construction jobs for nine months and then those folks don't have jobs after that. This is about generational educational opportunity. It's about generational wealth creation. It's not about just putting up affordable housing and saying, hey, we're going to give you a 40% AMI rent so you can live in this apartment. It's about getting that to be a home someday, getting you to be able to buy that condo someday. So we're going to talk about um, education and, and paths to prosperity for people. Um, we're going to have on-site public spaces so you can come in and talk to the developers. You're going to talk to any of us when we're here in town. We're going to have developer days where you can come in. We'll have a website set up where you can talk to us, give us feedback. We do view this as a continuous feedback loop. Um, we're going to have dedicated web, so uh, web resources so you can do that anytime you want, any hour of the day. And we're going to have outreach to schools so there's educational access. The operational stage, uh, we will have affordable housing on this site. We'll also have affordable for sale product. We'll have affordable retail space. And the reason that we know we can do that is we're not farming that out to a third party. The team that you see up here does that for a living. Portman Holdings, Portman Residential, Third Lake Partners, this is our capital. These are the things that we do. We're not farming it out to anybody else. Um, and then other things at the margins, like free and affordable fitness classes. We'll have communal spaces. We'll have the arts uh, spaces, like the Warehouse Arts District. And we're going to allow people to continue to express that creative spirit here in St. Petersburg. Uh, next slide. And again, I talked about this. I won't belabor it. But our community engagement, like I said, started years ago in this project, right here in this very ballroom. And we're excited that you're here tonight. Uh, we can't thank you enough. We really appreciate the feedback. And I look forward to the question and answer. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to our folks at HKS on our architectural team. Eric. Thank, thanks, Ken. So Ken mentioned we were right here back in 2016 meeting with all of you. And we could have easily relied on the thousands of pages of notes and the hundreds of comments that you guys gave us, the input that the city gave us in the RFP, just to formulate today's plan. The reality is I think the world is a lot different today than it was in 2016. You only have to touch your face to feel that, right? Well, this plan is going to take 10 years to do, and I guarantee you in 2030, the geopolitical issues, the socioeconomic issues are going to be a little bit different then. And so we're going to want to revisit this plan on a regular basis, not just once, over and over and over again. So we commit that to you guys, that we're going to be continuously doing this throughout the life of the project. You've seen a lot of the plans tonight. They all echo some of the same similar comments. We want to reconnect the streets. The streets are what's critical to building communities and connecting networks, connecting neighborhoods, and connecting the families. We know we've got an issue on the south with 175. It's a huge transportation issue. It's very critical to our healthcare community and the speed and access to some of the emergency services they provide. Problem is, it bifurcates the city. So how do we create openings underneath of it without lowering it? How do we create openings underneath of it that we can connect to Campbell Park and South St. Pete, get Deuces Live connected? How do we connect underneath 275 to the warehouse district and the arts district that's over there? How do we bring the folks from Edge District and Central Avenue District down into our connected properties and through the rest of the community? So we believe Booker Creek is a catalyst to that. We believe the city streets are a catalyst to that. We believe that by stitching back the fabric of the community, all those communities, all those families, all those neighborhoods will grow over time. It is not a flash in the pan. It's a work in progress. We ask you to come on the journey with us because we think you guys are the most important part to this whole process. 
We did this in Minneapolis when we did the Viking Stadium. We looked at the rich history that that city had, and it informed the design and the architecture of the stadium. Some of you may think it's a little funky, but there's a lot of things around St. Petersburg that are a little funky. Things happen because of stories from the past that present themselves for the future. We also look at the 21 guiding principles. These align with HKS's principles. HKS has adopted the AIA's uh, Committee on the Environment's guiding principles. We're part of the United Nations Green Global Council. So we believe in the socio and economic, not just the sustainability and the wellness, but all of the arts, the culture. Are we doing what's right for the people, the residents? Are we providing wellness programs, health and safety issues? Are we giving back? Are we creating smart city grids, providing the infrastructure to build on in the future, not at a cost, but as an opportunity? So we want to make sure we integrate all of that into the plan. Shelby, you want to talk a little about sustainability and wellness? Sure. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, sustainability is more than just being green. It's about community wellness. Three minutes. We have morning. a really, really unique opportunity here. We, we get a chance to really look at this as a district and do something very futuristic, very smart city. You know, our plan includes renewable energy, stormwater collection, rooftop gardens, community gardens, but it's also more than that. It's really how does that affect the community? And that, you know, you need to have access to food, access to transportation, access to jobs. You know, those are extremely critical to any plan. And then history and culture, you know, at the very heart of our whole plan is a cultural hub with a cultural arts center next to it for an amphitheater for local artists and partnering with local artists to really create the history and with locals to create the history of the site and really develop that over time and something that continually develops. And then Harvey's gonna tell you a little bit more of just how we really create that live, work, play atmosphere. Thanks, Shelby. Uh, good evening, my name is Harvey Wadsworth. I'm with Portman Residential. I focus on a residential business, but I'm just gonna go through the programming on the side and we're running short on time, so I'll have to go through this quick, but um, we believe we delivered a, a, a comprehensive plan, something that, that offers uh, a variety of end users, something that creates a 24-7 urban environment in St. Pete. But uh, we think we've delivered a plan based on the information we have, but the, uh, hopefully the key takeaway is this process has just started. W one thing we know for certain is our plan will change. We've received a tremendous amount of feedback from the community, but it's just started. We, we want your feedback, and as we continue to receive feedback, this plan will continue to evolve. Even after we start construction, the plan will continue to evolve, which is one reason why it's important to have a team that, that can execute on all product types in-house so that as the plan changes, the team stays consistent. Um, housing is a big part of it. You know, while we'll have, think mixed use, office, retail, hotel, you know, but it, it, housing's a major part of it. Um, and along with housing, it's, it's affordable housing. Um, we actually build a lot of affordable housing, but we're not known as affordable housing developers. It's because that product is integrated within our development so seamlessly that you don't know it's affordable housing. But it's, it's a major, major component and an emphasis so that it's a more equitable and diverse and, and community. Um, real quick though, just from a phasing perspective, the plan is to start in the northeast and kind of work our way southwest. Um, hopefully the rays stay. If they do, we're planning a 30,000 30, foot, or see, excuse me, stadium. If they, if they do not stay, the plan is to kind of continue the warehouse and arts district underneath the interstate. But I'll hand it off to Ken to talk more about our community benefits. Thank you. Well, with the last 30 seconds, I'm, I'm not even going to really reference the slide. I'm just going to say to you that you know, this again is not just about our vision here. Then the elephant in the room, and a few people have talked about it, is the Tampa Bay Rays. You know, will they stay? Will they go? Will they split the season between here and Canada? What's the city council going to do relative to what the mayor is going to do? Nobody wants to talk about those things, but that's the reality is that everybody has to figure out a way to harmonize what they're doing with all the other parties. You know, we've been doing that for decades. Um, we Time. have found solutions to complicated problems, and we're looking forward to doing that here with Tropicana Field. So thank you all for your attention, and we look forward to the Q&A session. All right, we are going to get set up for the question and answer portion of our presentation. Please feel free to drop off any last minute questions that you have in the comment boxes. If not, we will be with you shortly. Thank you. Thank you for your attention through the presentations. We are very fortunate tonight to have as our MC for the question and answer period, Trevor Pettiford from Bay News 9. Trevor has been given the questions and he's made uh, his selections. So he will be handling the moderation of our question and answer. And this will go for an hour. Please help me welcome him to St. Petersburg.
Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. All right, let's try that one more time, okay? Good evening, everyone. There we go. Thank you so much for coming this evening, and thank you so much for having me here. Uh, we have a lot of questions that came in, a lot of really good questions. Uh, I went through them and tried to get them grouped together. There were a lot of questions that a lot of uh, people asked the same, so if you didn't hear your question specifically, part of your question is probably in one of the questions that I'm going to ask that kind of groups them all together. So we're going to try to get through this as uh, fluently as possible and hopefully get through all the questions and get all your questions answered. So enough from me talking, let's get to the questions. Uh, the first one, and there were a lot of questions about how these developments were going to uh, connect with the African American community, to South St. Pete and to the history of the property there. So with that in mind, I will ask the question, how specifically will the history of South St. Pete be brought to life at the TROP site, and how will it connect to the current South St. Petersburg community? Uh, we will start uh, from the left, from my left here to your right, and just go uh, all the way to this end, okay? So let's start with Unicorp. How much time? Uh, there will be three minutes for this question, or for the answer. Uh, Lashante, we take this one? Um, I think, as I spoke earlier, one of the things we want to make sure is that we recognize that everybody's history is different. And so we'll be developing a coalition and really taking advice from the community on what they're looking for. One of the things that we've always noticed is that art is a reflective way to, to show, showcase what our history is all about as well. So art would be a part of that. But again, we want to hear from the community and we want to make sure that we're doing, doing just by it. Um, we want to hear from people like my grandparents who were here and who lost out on certain things. We want to hear from people who are your parents, who are your family and friends that got certain things. And so we're going to really, really try our best to connect. We're not going to try our best. We are. We're going to connect to the African-American community by communication and by transparency as well. I think one of the things we need to make sure is that we're very transparent in what we're doing within the organization. We want a popular, we want everybody from each population that represents St. Pete to come together and have a voice on this. So one thing again is we'll connect it by the arts, but also connect the future and connect South St. Pete by bringing them to the table and having those conversations about what this looks like to them as well. Yeah, nice, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so as you heard earlier in our presentation, uh, a lot of this process and making sure that we are actually engaged with the community is part of bringing you into the process and being a part of that. So while our design already has connections to Deuces, has connections to South St. Pete, we envision that engagement that we're going to have with you as something that is an ongoing concept and it's an actual practice that will take place as we all work together. And I'm also going to turn it over to Reverend Watson Haynes because he has something else to say about it. I think the key to what we're about is uh, I grew up, I was born and raised in gas plant. I was relocated. My family was relocated. So when it was an opportunity to get involved in this process and we began to talk with Midtown, I asked them, are we going to be on the table or at the table? And Midtown said to us, you're going to be at the table helping to make decisions about what's going to happen. And so when they talked about apartment building, uh, uh, they asked us, where should the doors be? When they talked about how many uh, uh, housing units, they asked us, what do we think about it? And so it was not just a Watson Haynes deal. They tied down a deal with the Pinellas County Urban League, which transcends Watson Haynes into the future so that when they begin to do things with this project, it's not a one-shot deal, that is a long-term deal. We are at the table, not on the table. Thank you. Uh, look, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> um, it's a great answer to, yeah, it's a great answer. So I, I, I would say, you know, this is a competition, of course, but, you know, it's, it's also not always about disagreeing with what other people say. Some people can give a perfectly great answer and to have the confidence to say, that's a great answer, very good, and I agree. You have to have people at the table. And we, we don't have all the answers. You know, I mentioned earlier, we've got the endorsement uh, from nearly a dozen 
other African American reverends and pastors in this community, but it would be very presumptuous for me to assume that one or two or five or ten of those people have got all the answers. So this is an iterative process. It's going to take time. We don't have the answers on these PowerPoint slides tonight. Uh, I wish I did. Other way, um, you know, I'd, I'd be able to tell the future, right? I can't do that. So what I will say to you is you have a promise that to reconnect, and I think the question was how do you reconnect the community of, that used to be there in the gas plant? I think it's about looking at the past, but also creating a sense of place. You know, when we work with folks at HKS, you know, HKS is not only the largest sports stadium designer in the world, they're about creating a sense of place. And to do that, you have to look at the people that are going to occupy the place. And it's not just about people and buildings. It's about what were the materials that were used in the gas plant district 30 and 40 years ago. Bring some of those back. Have historical markers that recognize great leaders that built that district and great leaders that are going to continue to build the district. It's not about just the past or our ideas or the future. It's a combination of all of those things to create a very historical, but yet a modern sense of place. And we're committed to do that to engaging the community. So thank you. Hear me okay? Okay, terrific. So uh, I think a lot of good points have been made already. Uh, the way that we think about this is, is twofold, that there are really two ways to reconnect. One is by educating. So what I've learned in a lot of the discussions that I've had in this community uh, over the past several months, and I think our team has heard this as well, is that there are many people who understand and appreciate what was at the shop before, but there are many who don't, frankly. And so we want to make sure that people who come and visit the site have an opportunity to learn about the businesses, the leaders, the communities that were here originally. That's why we've proposed something that we call the History Walk. It's essentially a uh, linear history museum that stretches from one side of the site to the other. Uh, it'll use a variety of media, plaques, public art, et cetera, to tell the story of those people and tell the story of this community. We think that's important. We also think that's necessary but not sufficient. We believe the other way to honor this community is to understand what it was. This was a vibrant place filled by real people. They celebrated the arts. Uh, they were known for community gardens and fruit trees. Uh, they were known for celebrations and festivals. And so creating a truly inclusive, accessible neighborhood that include that connects to those parts of the historical context we believe is really important so we're proposing uh, to make a significant investment in urban farming here which harkens back to the days of the fruit trees uh, and the urban uh, and the uh, neighborhood gardens we're proposing an art center that would be available to all with a public gallery so we've learned the release in a public art gallery in St. Peter museums there are private galleries there's an opportunity to create a, a public art gallery. We're also looking at uh, uh, developing an artist in residence program in our affordable housing to make sure that artists have a, have a place to live affordably. So those are the kinds of things that we believe are important and that we think can reconnect to the history of the site in a couple of different ways. And I'll pass this along to Sarah Jane for a couple of more thoughts. Sure. I think it's important to honor the difficult legacy of the site by inviting people to engage, the people who were previously displaced, the communities that were affected, to engage in the decision-making process. And so we've put a lot of thought into our community-driven development and our outreach program as a result of that. And so we will be focusing our efforts into allowing people to have a voice as to what happens on the site to honor the difficult legacy of the site, which led them to be displaced and uh, to suffer economically, socially culturally. Um, so we think that's a very important part of it as well. All right, thank you very much. Next question is staying on the same general topic and we will begin with Midtown and then go from here, there, and then you will be last, Unicorp. The question is, and this is a three-minute answer, uh, how will you integrate four-star hotels convention centers and high-end properties with lower socioeconomic properties on the site? Midtown. That's, uh, you, that's, that's, oh, sorry, thank you. That's city building. City, very simply, uh, a well-balanced city is a city that has all the different pieces of the fabric of that city woven into it. And that's the important part of, of exactly what we're trying to do. And we can't do it without all of you, and we can't do it without the city and the business community and everybody working together. So the, I, I think that the, the question 
is, is pretty simply answered. Whenever you look at successful cities, you see that there's a, a proper integration across the board of all the different mechanisms of economics and well-being. It's a holistic approach. And if you're taking that holistic approach, which is what the 21 guiding principles are really about, then you should end up with exactly that vision becoming a reality. The one other thing that you do in cities is you create addresses. And so there'll be an address that will be corporate oriented where you can group together hotels and office buildings, say maybe around a piazza or around Central Park, which is good for residential addresses. And you can have different price points and different qualities of life and different characteristics by a variety of addresses. And that's the fun of diversity. Trevor, I think I heard the question clearly, but I would like you to repeat it if you don't mind, just to make sure. Uh, sure, no problem. It is, how will you integrate four-star hotels, convention centers, and high-end properties with lower socioeconomic properties? Right. Thank you very much for doing that. So, I mean, that's essentially what we tried to do. Um, when we looked at a master plan that has a stadium and or no stadium, um, you know, stadiums are catalysts for these lifestyle environments. They're catalysts for the foot traffic around the stadium, for the activities, the retail, et cetera. The challenge is what do you do the other 200 days of the year that the stadium is not active? Or what do you do from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the evening when it's not active? So you have to integrate medical centers, institutions of higher learning. You have to bring convention center hotels that populate the streets, that activate the retail, the restaurants, all of the sub amenities that are there, and those create jobs. Those are great jobs, and they are all varying different levels of jobs. So we want to look at it as an integrated piece. So the question, obviously, is what happens when the stadium is not there? That's when you look to your institutions of higher learning, your academic centers, your medical centers, and you look to your convention center hotel to drive those businesses. You guys have tremendous amenities here in St. Petersburg to sell, right? What we have to do is we have to look at the convention market and figure out what, what types of groups we can bring here to activate that on a regular basis. But creating that, that livelihood that occupies that site, not 88 days a year, and not from 6 o'clock to midnight, but all the time. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree with everything that's been said, you know, before us, and I think, you know, the, the community of St. Pete's is really fortunate. There is a lot of talented people up here uh, on all four teams. Some incredible designers, some incredible kind of community um, kind of voices. And, and I think as, as the development community has learned over the last 30 years, we've learned from our mistakes. And, you know, great urban design now essentially asks that question at the very beginning of these projects. And, and, and says, how do we create a sense of community? How do we blend that hospitality, that leisure, that sense of 24, uh, seven city that we can have in smaller communities. You don't have to be in a large urban community to have that sense of place, you know, both, you know, in the morning, afternoon, and night. And I think that's how, you know, we do it. We, we essentially, when we've done it before, where you're able to kind of bring in these great, talented people to essentially put together designs that don't separate these different uses. They actually say, we're going to put them together. We're going to be highly integrated. We're going to be highly curated. And that's how you do it in today's great developments. I got a chance to drive uh, St. Pete's today when I got into town, and the first thing I did was drive the project area, I went into the uh, Campbell Park area, the Melrose area, and you realize the more you learn about this community, it used to be exactly what we're trying to create now. That's very important to know. They did it right back in the day, the area we're calling Sugar Hill, they did it right back then. And then over the years, there's broken promise after broken promise after broken promise. And then all of a sudden, one group of people gets discarded and they become an afterthought. So I think everybody up here is committed to doing it right. All I'm going to say to you is hold us accountable at the end of the day. We cannot walk out of here saying we're going to do certain things to integrate and create an environment where our project, Sugar Hill, becomes a community that works for everyone. That's our commitment, but you've got to hold us accountable, and that's up to you as a community to do that. I'm a former mayor. So I've said on the other side, I think your mayor, your council, you folks in the community are doing a great job. You guys have to hold every developer up here accountable to make good on whatever it is that we're saying we're going to do. When I joined JMA, this development team, 
I told him, I said, look, if you didn't notice, I'm an African-American. I can put it a different way, I'm black. So that's gonna be my unapologetic commitment to make sure what we do is gonna represent the black community of St. Pete's. That's not anti any other group. You can still be pro-African-American without being anti and being inclusive of everybody else, and that's our commitment. Thank you, um, good answer. I think the question was how do you integrate the hotel and the different uh, levels of uh, residential. First of all, we do have a letter of intent from Marriott and they do want to do a 60,000 square foot convention center. So, but the way you do it is indistinguishably. You should not be able to tell the difference in the different levels of residential. We want it all to be integrated, to be one great community where you are living next door to a neighbor and you don't know what your neighbor makes, he doesn't know what you make, you integrate the entire community. And I'm gonna let Bernard talk about that more. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the question. I think there have been some great answers. <clears throat> but I think the question really needs to be thought of differently. Integrating those functions is not really hard when you have a great place. And I know a lot of rich folks that go to, you know, barbecue and jazz clubs, and I know a lot of poor folks that go to parks and public space. I think the most important thing we can do is to create an authentic community. It's not about making a development. It's not about making a bunch of buildings on sites. It's not even, frankly, about making a park. It's about putting it all together in a way where everyone is invited and that those who have been dishonored in the past have an opportunity to express their anger and their disappointment and to make sure they're included. So I think the integration aspect is really not the hard part. The hard part is, how do you create everything in such a way that you can make it feel like it was always there and that everybody is welcome? Thank you. This next question, again, staying on the same topic of residential properties there, will begin, I believe I started with you, and then we'll go there, second, uh, third, and fourth. This, you'll have one minute to answer this. This is a fairly uh, straightforward question. What percentage of housing will be apartments, and what percentage will be condos? So, as I mentioned in our presentation, we, we have a plan, we, ha we have a vision for the side of what we think needs to be there, but this process is just starting. So if you want to know what our current plan is, it's probably 30% for sale and 70% and rental. But again, this is just our plan and this is just the start. We, we really want to know what you want to see here, what the community wants to see and, and, and you know, what type of housing product. We, you know, we keep receiving feedback, um, but, but it's just started. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. So um, I think what's really important here is that we want to give people in the community the opportunity to build equity at home and have that sense of belonging, which we think is critical. It relates to the answer was given a couple of minutes ago about how important it is to do successful placemaking and, and create a real neighborhood. Um, we, we've committed to developing at least 100 affordable condos. We'll certainly do more if there's an opportunity to do that, if the market supports it. Um, broadly speaking, I think the mix of housing we'll deliver is, is going to be shaped by what the market tells us we go forward. How quickly can it be absorbed? What kind of product are people looking for? Um, but the important part here is making sure that we have housing at all price levels and that it's fully integrated. So this should be attainable housing, whether you're at uh, one income level or another, and that you're creating a neighborhood that feels organic. I mean, going back to what we talked about a couple of minutes ago, I, I agree. I don't think the challenge is integration. Neighborhoods have done this organically for a long time in urban environments. The, 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 the trick is programming it in such a way so that it feels accessible to all, welcoming to all, and everyone belongs there. So I, you know, our answer is... Time. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've learned a lot in the last couple of days. I, I really think we need to have more ownership into the, the community that we want to develop. Uh, there's a gentleman here last night, and if you were here, he wanted to be heard, James, and I talked to him outside for a little while. And we've got about 4,000 residential units shown on our plan, but I really think uh, a good percentage of those, and it will be market-driven, but a good percentage of those should be for ownership. 
the, the people who, it shouldn't be us developers owning this project. It should be the community. So I, I think a, a good level of, uh, of what we build there needs to be owned by people so they have a stake in their own community, so they live there. It, things are much more important to you when you own it. And if, if you rent, you're going to be gone in a year or two years, and it's really not your community. It needs to have ownership in it, and, and we're convinced that we need to do that. So obviously, we're the last one, so we've had a little bit of time to chit chat amongst ourselves. It's, it's an interesting question, and it's also a little bit uh, esoteric because we're talking about a project that we're all competing for and trying to, to win at this point, which really all that does is it gets that team to the starting line. It doesn't mean that you get to do anything. In fact, you, don't even, you haven't even won the project, really, because you still have to get in front of city council and have your contract agreed to. So um, it, the, the issue with trying to decide how many units are rental and how many are ownership today, when this project, and we've talked about this since the beginning of our presentation tonight, is going to continue to evolve with your input, this project is going to change over time. Those models that you see over there, that is not what your project is going to look like. It's going to be very different than that. Better, but different. And time. To, put, to put a number today, I think, is really not fair for us to say to you. All right. Thank you. The next question deals with local business. Uh, we'll start again on my far right here and then make it our way all the way down till you are the final ones to speak. The question is, how transparent will the process be for local vendors to rent or own retail space? Again, how transparent will the process be for local vendors to rent or own retail space? Time. Uh, you have two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's in, I, I'm not, do, do, transparency, do we, is that? Uh, how, uh, okay, I got it, it's fine. So. Um, I, mean, I think what we would say is, and we spent some time on this yes, uh, last night as well, is uh, we are very committed to enabling local businesses here. We believe it's the right thing to do. We also, frankly, believe it's the smart business decision. St. Petersburg has a well-deserved reputation for local, organically driven retail. I don't think I need to say, but I will anyway, that if that's 20% of your mix and chains are 80%, versus the other way around, you're in a little bit of a, that, that's not a good place to be. So that's something that we believe is the right answer in all kinds of different respects. We've uh, proposed a number of ways that we think we can be helpful to local businesses. Uh, for example, we can have a certain amount of retail space, which we will do that's a smaller uh, 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 premises, right? which makes it easier for someone who's a small business owner to rent. We'll be flexible on rent terms. Uh, they'll be, uh, you know, typically we'll offer free rent up front. All those things are possible. I want to talk about one specific example that we've already identified, uh, which is what we've had, dis we've had discussions with Mike Harding, who runs Three Daughters Brewing here in town. He also happens to be the head of the Florida Brewers Association. Of the 400 brewers in the state of Florida, none are owned by an African American, zero. And what Mike has said he wants to do in partnership with us is to help finance, mentor, and support an entrepreneur, an African American entrepreneur who wants to launch the first black owned brewery and that'll happen on the property of the tribe. So that's one example of many that we will pursue to help support the community in that regard. Ernie. Thank you. And then as far as specifically transparency, that's one thing we know a whole lot about. Tampa Airport, City of Tampa, City of St. Pete, Pinellas Schools, reporting. Once we develop it, once we develop the plan and put the plan in place, we're going to give reports. We're going to come to you. We're going to have transparency. When we, when we tell you we're going to do something, we're going to lay the plan out. We're going to show you how we track it, whether it's spreadsheets, whether it's graphs, whether it's reports. And we're going to report to you monthly and share that information Hi. and ask for you to verify that we're doing what we said we do. So we're all about transparency. Thomas, Ariel, Dukon, we do okay, it all that's over time. the state. So we're used to that, and we welcome transparency. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just so, and, and I think uh, if I can add with the, the transparency, I believe the question to expand on it, and I think you touched on it, was to see uh, how many, uh, the, if we would be able to see the number of women uh, owners, uh, minority business owners, and that like uh, involved in that, that we would be able to see that percentage and be able to see the transparency of the kinds of people that would be able to rent the spaces, if I think I understood the question correctly. So. If you would, please. Uh, what makes communities like St. Petersburg 
a great place is having locals. In Orlando, we have chain after chain after chain, and we wish we had more of the locals. Luckily, here in St. Petersburg, you've, you've got that. The great flavors that locals make, uh, the, the different businesses, the different character, the different charm. We absolutely want that. In our entire portfolio, we have lots and lots and hundreds of locals, and we always work with them. I mentioned earlier that we sit with them, we look at their business plan, we help them through it, we provide tenant improvement money so they can get their business built. And also, in our proposal, we have given three months free rent to any local. We want to work with them, we want to get them started up. And like I mentioned earlier, too, even during COVID, COVID was a very, very tough time. You know, Restaurants were closed, retail establishments were closed, and these people could not pay their rent during that time. We worked with every one of them, we kept every one of them open, we didn't give them the threat of eviction. We are completely transparent, we're open book, I answer my phone all the time, we don't discriminate against anybody, we want to fill space, we want to fill it with locals in the community, and even our contractors we've hired, we hired Power Design, they already work for us on several developments that we do, and they will be working for us here, and they're your third largest employer. And Shanti, would you talk? And then again, as part, part of my responsibility with inclusivity is to hold this group accountable. So there will be quarterly reports that need to be issued that we'll be able to get out to the community. One way to get out to the community is by utilizing some of the resources that we already have. The Weekly Challenger, which is the oldest African-American newspaper, and gets disseminated out to a lot of different individuals out in this community. We'll be utilizing the Weekly Challenger. The Weekly Challenger is the best source. It goes to the churches, and they have a great online presence. So we definitely want to utilize that. There's other digital magazines that we'll be transparent with as well, um, that we're working with those companies as well. So again, transparency, but also accountability is key. And with those quarterly reports, you'll see the accountability that Unicorp has for this community. Time. I, th I think the answer, what I've seen in my experience is to have make ready space. What does that mean? First, the local tenant's not gonna pre-lease a space and wait a year and a half for the building to be built. So part of our financial commitment is to build 100,000 square feet of office and more important, 100,000 square feet of retail. So the local chef, I've seen it time after time, they go to open a restaurant, they're like, yeah, you just need a grease trap, it'll take two months. A year passes by, you know, they're already broke, they can't, you know, they're already, and the work hasn't even, real work hasn't even begun. So I think the answer is we plan to do make ready space and then work with the Urban League to help choose who is true local and is willing to put their best foot forward. And our job is to bring them customers. And if anyone knows anything about the Pinellas County Urban League, we are focused on wealth building for small businesses. And a lot of problems that we run into through in our Serious Business Academy is many businesses have a hard time starting up with infrastructure. The Midtown Project is going to uh, have pop-up uh, sites for small businesses to come in and the infrastructure will already be in place. So the small businesses won't have to worry about the startup. They need to just be prepared to get in and start serving customers and building their wealth. Uh, you know, you've heard three different answers. They're all really good. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat everything I heard. I'll just say that we are committed to transparency to the extent that we can get a local tenant that puts dollars back into this community. We're going to do that. And we'd rather see a lot more local businesses than a lot of chain restaurants and chain type of organizations. Because e even if you have a business that's got maybe a local owner, but it's a national brand, some of that money gets sucked back out of St. Petersburg to a corporate headquarters or a national organization. Our goal is to have more local businesses, and we will be completely transparent about it uh, as, as we lease the space. Thank you. The next question here is dealing with phase and development. We'll begin over with Unicorp here and go the, the way we did before. I'm actually going to combine two of these questions because they seem very similar, and you, I'll give you three minutes uh, to answer this. Uh, so what will the first phase be? When will the first phase be operational? Oh, let me try that again. Will the first phase be fully operational while St. Pete and the Rays work out their differences? Uh, and over what period of time is the development expected to take in the phasing? Sure. Does everyone get that question? What uh, again? Will the first phase be fully operational while the Saint, while St. Pete and the Rays work out their differences, and over what period of time is the development expected to take its phasing? Uh, there's a little bit of legality in that question, but uh, let me do the best I can with it. Uh, from what we've 
read in the agreements is that if parking is replaced, the Rays do have the ability to bless the, the program of any developer, and I don't think they can unreasonably withhold blessing that. So, you know, providing that, that we get the approval from the Rays, we can start at the, the east end of, of the property and start working our way west. So we would, we would construct parking to replace parking that we're going to remove, and then we would start building our plan as you see it, or as it morphs, as we all talked about. The plans will morph. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out, because I, I heard a couple people say, it will be completely different than what you see. We're hoping it's not completely different. We're hoping it's, it's better, but whenever we present these type of things, we deliver on what we show unless we get community feedback that says, make this change, make that change. But it, it won't be anything less than what we show, and I want to make that clear. And so this is a project that's going to take about a decade to do. I think 10 years to build everything out. Like the mayor said earlier, I think it's very important to recognize the, the seven years that the Rays have left should not impede a great plan. And the plan should not be built around the fact that they're there now. It should be built as it should be in the future. And one thing also to keep in mind is to do a new stadium, whether it's on this property or whether it's on another property, that decision has to be made, if not this year, no later than next year. Because it takes five years to be able to design and build and develop a stadium like that. So that decision is going to be made early on in the process. We're all going to know the Rays are going to stay here or they're going to go somewhere else. So we will be able to bring our plan and just keep moving it to the, to the west. Thank you. Sorry. The, the first phase is for, for our plan is actually, it's in the northeast corner of the site. And what we've done is, is we've designed the, the, the first phase so that it encompasses all of the Grow Smarter plan and in that first phase and in each phase as, as we would continue on. Um, and as a part of that first phase, we've also created, we've overparked it so that we can provide the replacement parking for the raise during that time frame. And, you know, negotiations, what's going on the raise, obviously we can't answer any of that. Um, uh, but like Chuck said, the building of a new ballpark will take a, a good four to five years, possibly six. So, you know, plus the negotiations. So there's a timing issue there with that. But that doesn't necessarily impact that first phase as long as you provide that replacement parking according to the contract. Uh, the other thing that's important, just kind of a global scale, is the growth of the project is tied directly to the 2050 plan, which I'm going to let uh, Ben talk about. All right. My name is Ben Suwinski. I'm with VHB. Uh, we're uh, proud partners of the city in conducting the uh, St. Pete 2050 visioning plan uh, that just wrapped up. As part of that plan, we conducted a very detailed market assessment, and the Midtown proposal uh, matches that 30-year market assessment. So uh, the entire 85 acres could be absorbed in 10 years, in 20 years, but real, we're really targeting that 30-year vision that the city just invested uh, a lot of time and money in uh, visioning out. Well, I want to start by applauding the one or two people that wrote that question because it's a, uh, it's a very, very, very good question. It's very difficult to answer, and you succeeded at making 30 or 40 people on this side of the room squirm. So congratulations. Um, it is a very difficult decision. I mean, these folks spoke about it. Uh, phase one almost has to start in the northeast because it's the only piece that's not critical to baseball operations right now. Take that off the table, that's a given, so to speak. We know we've got some investigative work with Booker Creek. There's some engineering that has to happen, not just on our site here at Tropicana, but further upstream, and how it affects some of the wastewater issues coming, or stormwater issues coming down. So there's work like that that can be done. There's transportation issues that can be done. There's connection of the streets that can be done. So there's a lot of those kind of things that we might label first phase, but you may not necessarily see day one. Then we're going to have to think a little bit about what the Rays do or don't do, and that's going to impact some things. But more importantly, we don't want to go out day one and build a whole bunch of empty buildings that there isn't demand to fill. Okay? So it's a calculated approach. It makes it very difficult to answer the second portion of the question, the overall development timeline. 
I'd love to be able to stand here and tell you by April 4th, 2027, we're going to be done. It, it just doesn't work like that. So we, we know what the goal is from the city. We know we've got about a roughly seven to 10 year time frame. Are we going to fit inside of that? I hope. I, I, I really hope. I, that's the goal. But I can't tell you today definitively what that time frame is. Uh, so I think this is a this is a tough one to back clean up on. Those are those are all good answers. I think they hit a lot of the important points. Um, j just to frame it from our standpoint, I mean, clearly the Rays have a very important seat at the table, and so to figure out what should happen, how it will happen, when it will happen, as as the other three groups have pointed out, a lot of that is going to turn on whether the Rays stay, whether they go. If they do stay, what's their preference for where the ballpark goes on the site? How does they get resolved and negotiated with the city and with the development partners? So I think that's number one. We can completely agree that there's a lot of site work, a lot of analysis that needs to be done that can happen in parallel with those discussions and that process. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, this is about market demand and market absorption. So the developer, we, we would certainly be uh, highly motivated to bring the project or as much of the project online as quickly as possible. That's how you create place to some degree. That's how you create a vibrant neighborhood. But we need to do that given the constraints associated with the raise and given what the market tells us about how quickly different types of product can be successfully absorbed. Thank you. Thank you. The next several questions are going to deal with transportation. And we will begin with Midtown, go through that same process. The first question, you'll have two minutes to answer. How will you incorporate parking in your designs? Again, how will you incorporate parking in your designs? Midtown. Uh, good evening. My name is Matt Walker. I'm a civil engineer with George F. Young here in St. Pete. And I think you actually just kind of heard our answer in the previous question where we have uh, the consultant VHB who, who just invested a lot of time and energy with the city of St. Petersburg with the, the 2050 plan that uh, we're going to phase our parking approach so that we, we are fully and adequately parked for phase one phase two, all the way through, even if the race stay or go, we have a very thought out and well um, proportioned plan so that we have parking dispersed amongst our site um, to, that can adequately serve the needs of this development. Thank you. You know, great, great question. You know, how long do we have? How long do you guys want me to talk about parking? Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, parking is really changing in, you know, cars are really changing. You know, the future 10 years from now, we're saying this is going to be a long development. It's not going to be the same. We're going to have to look at parking garages a little, little different, you know, and design them so they can be flexible. We know we're going to need parking for the raise. We know we're going to need parking garages day one. How do you design that to be flexible? That's really important. So that's one. The second thing is really shared parking. So as we do phase one, you got to have the parking for the raise. you got to have shared parking. Well, you don't need excess, excess parking. We'd, that whole site would be full of parking garages. That's not what you want. We can do shared parking with the multifamily, shared parking with the office, shared parking with the churches, things that have other uses, so that way everything kind of ties together. And then it's more than just having it just to be a parking garage and concrete that's out there. You know, it's building it into the community so it has a facade on it. You put green roofs on it, you put solar panels on it, you make it so it's not just a true parking garage, and think about the future with it. Yeah, we agree that they well, are, are let me just, strategies. Just a second, yeah. real quick, sorry about that. So the, the other thing we have to think about is the old school mentality of build a stadium and surround it by parking. What we want to build is a district that includes parking. So maybe you're coming at 4.35 o'clock after work, you're eating downtown at the restaurant by the waterfront, you're taking a, a mobile transportation or an Uber or a bike or something, and you're going back after the game, and you're spending your money in the community, you're use it, using the, the benefit of the overall district for parking and not just right here in a concrete pad. Thank you. Yeah, we agree, for example, on, with the strategies that the others have mentioned. For example, shared parking. Clearly, office uses do not peak their parking demand when residential uses do. So mixing the land uses strategically will get our parking down. Uh, we know that parking is changing. We know that automobile use is changing. What we want to do, though, is we want to expedite that on this site because we have the economies of scale to do so. We can, for example, you know, really have, by enhancing the Pinellas Trail, by enhancing the connections to Sunrunner, by expediting 16th Street 
which goes right into our site as a complete street. We can move micro-mobility and active transportation, which just means bike, e-scooter, ped, all of those ways of getting into and out of the site. We can expedite the way in which those start to reduce parking demand overall. Once we've got that reduced, not that it is one then the other, but at the same time that we would reduce those parking demands, we're also accommodating less parking by mixing uses and having uses uh, share the parking spaces over time, over the course of a day. David? So I'll just add three things. One, as again, being as a mayor, the first thing that was important for us to park for parking is that it did not look like an eyesore that we had integrated into the city. And I think all these developers, I'm sure, are going to find a way to do that. So that was number one. Number two, as a 3.0 city like St. Pete's, that next level of being a smart city and innovation, you can create technology that when people come into town, they can look at their iPhone and determine where their parking spots are. So that app will give you the ability to determine where you can park, and that certainly helps with congestion on a big sporting event. And then thirdly, which is kind of cool, you can determine ingress and egress. So we in Sacramento strategically did parking here. So if you lived in that area, Time. you would park in this zone. If you lived here in the north, you would have a parking zone there. If you lived in the east, you would have a parking zone there. So it, it helped impact your ingress and egress. So just being really thoughtful in parking can make a big difference in the community. We are not going to have any parking. <laughs> Kidding. You've heard enough about parking, I'm sure, but Bernard's going to tell you about our parking. Isn't he great? That's, that's the best answer of the night. Um, there have been a lot of good points, and I don't need to repeat them. The shared parking, the peak hour, the non-peak hour. I want to get more to what you see and how you feel. Um, the residential and office buildings, the way we've been doing our architectural work over these years is that the parking is within the donut and what you see on the street is always alive and, and, and habitable. Uh, and if you look at our plan, you'll see that we've done liner buildings for all of our residential. Our office building is also not on a podium. Uh, and I think that's important because it brings life to the street and you're not looking at ugly garages. Uh, the other thing is, as someone mentioned, cars are changing and parking is changing. So all these garages that are filled with ramps, we don't do the ramp garages in the same way anymore. We do flat floor garages so that those buildings can be turned into something else in the future. And the ramps are minimal and they're outside basically the, the typical situation so that we can tear the ramp down and we can reuse the garages. Uh, the peak issue is really important, and all of us, I'm sure, uh, of course we feel really good about our own plan, means that when, uh, if the stadium, if the ballpark comes, we want to delay the, the egress, and we want to delay the ingress. How do you do that? By giving people interesting stuff to do. So we want to have the retail and the cafes and the restaurants. If you've ever been to San Diego or to Denver or to San Francisco or any of the great ballparks, they really minimize their parking peak demand by giving people a lot of really great stuff to do. And finally, I'd like to give Jared the, the uh, opportunity to talk about transit. Thanks, Bernard. We really believe in providing people options. Time. So that we talked about the Sunrunner and that comes every 15 minutes, providing that connection east and west, and then also transit that could go north-south. So it's really about, again, pr providing options to the site and really implementing the, the city's I'm sorry, street effort. I'm sorry, that's Simon. And actually, there will be a question coming up about transit shortly as well. Uh, and actually, we, we, you touched on something about um, a bike pass. That's going to be my next question, which I think everyone should get an opportunity to ask. So we'll begin with you. Um, the question is, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry about that. What are plans to increase bike traffic mobility and mobility? And you have two minutes to answer this question. Uh, what are the plans to increase bike traffic and mobility? Bike traffic and mobility. Two minutes. Um, OK, thank you. Um, well, as an avid cyclist, I know I don't look like it, but as an avid cyclist that does 125 miles a week, I, I'm excited to see more bike paths, and I'm hoping we can find a way to maybe collaborate with the cars because it gets pretty dangerous, especially when you're in urban environments. Um, 
Pinellas Trail is a phenomenal bike path. Uh, I, I don't know that you need to build on that. Um, what we probably need to think about is more on the street level uh, where we do have a separation of bike lanes yeah. versus vehicle lanes. Um, for those of you that are commuter bikers, a lot of people don't like to do that because of the dangers of riding side by side by a car. Uh, you know, we here in Florida, it's not, it's not local to St. Pete. We here in Florida believe in big mirrors, big side view mirrors, and they come with big trucks, right? And so when you're on a bicycle and you have a big F-150 coming by you, it's a little intimidating. So we have to find a way to create the space. Um, but there, you know, the site needs to connect to the existing fabric of bike lanes and not necessarily create a velodrome around it that would create three miles or four miles of bike paths on our site. I don't, I don't think that's the appropriate thing to do. We have to complement what's already there, build upon it, and provide comfortable commuter traffic. Thank you. Yeah. One of the most important things to get a cyclist moving, I happen to ride 8,500 miles a year myself, as you can probably tell from my, my, the size of me, um, is to make streets complete. And all that means is make it work for every form of mobility. That includes cycling. That means narrowing lanes to slow speeds. That means providing protected bike lanes. That means providing on-street parking which protects cyclists and protects pedestrians in their paths of travel. So we have a complete streets approach throughout the entire project so we can move people within project boundaries. Let me also mention that it's important to have corridors that lead into the site. You're all familiar with 16th Street. That's a huge corridor from the south into the site. That particular complete streets project is way down in the complete streets implementation plan for, for, the, for the city. 18th Avenue, which runs east-west, further to the south, is under study right now. So one of the things we would do, of course, is to ask the city to move up 16th Street so that we can have 18th Avenue, which runs east-west, connect to 16th Street, which runs north-south, and have really good bicycle conduits into the site. Those are specifics that we're willing to work on with the city, having looked at their capital improvement program to get beyond the generalities. Um, we really have to incorporate bike valet within office buildings, within residential buildings, bike rental, bike sharing, and even community-oriented bike you know, storage. Those are all options that can be built in because we have this wonderful opportunity. You have this wonderful opportunity to take, you know, 80-something acres and have and de dedicate certain parts of it to those kind of shared biking uh, facilities. Of course, there's Time. also the Pinellas Trail, which we're going to enhance, as mentioned. Thank you. Gosh, just two minutes on this question. I wish I could talk more on that. I'm excited about this topic. I actually live a mile from the site and thought a lot about this as I bike around the community. I mean, what an opportunity, the Pinellas Trail that we have. And a lot of times right now, you, you ride the Pinellas Trail, it's hot, there's no shade, there's no businesses. Now that's, that's changed in some parts of, of Pinellas County. But what an opportunity to have development that faces and interacts with the Pinellas Trail and people can enjoy that, take a break. Also, the north-south connection you know, along Booker Creek. What an opportunity to, to ride along a trail north-south that connects across 175 over to South St. Pete. So it's about that north-south connections and, and the east-west connections. And then also internal to the site, it's about creating and designing streets where you can feel safe. So it doesn't have to be a dedicated trail, but speeds are slow. Um, you can bike and feel safe. So thanks for that question. Is it us? Okay. So for us, biking in the city is really fun. And you can't really talk about biking without starting with the Pinellas Trail, which is one of the great state bike routes and, and exercise routes from Tarpon Springs to Terra Verde. And what's fun about it is when you're biking on it, you go through a lot of different environments. So we can design the Pinellas Trail so that the experience of biking through the TROP is memorable and different and special, and we can start there. What we can do now is, since there are no streets on our site, we know we need six feet wide for one bike lane in one direction, six feet in another. We can now design our streets perfectly 
to accommodate any new bike path so that the entire network is safe and we can put paths wherever we would like to bike to, starting especially with a bike path that will go over to the deuces. We can use the wide right-of-way that's on 16th Street to accommodate safe bike lanes in each direction. And so we can craft a beautiful composition of different ways to bike around, but it all starts with the Pinellas Trail. Thank you. The next question again with transportation is going into a bigger picture on mass transit. And we will begin with you on the far right here and move this way. Uh, the question is, and you have three minutes to answer, as the county moves towards green energy, how do you plan to include in your infrastructure for mass transit in your development of this site? Question again, as the county moves towards green energy, how do you plan to include in your infrastructure for mass transit in the development of this site? Three minutes. Okay, it sounds like there are a couple of questions here. One relates to sustainable practices on the, on the project site and the other relates to how mass transit will be incorporated. So I, I, um, with respect to sustainability, I'll say a couple of things. One is what's interesting about this site, the size of the site, is it presents opportunities for district-wide solutions. Uh, that could be, uh, you know, uh, that could be an energy storage facility, for example, uh, there are opportunities for PV arrays here. We're proposing a significant PV array as part of the convention center. Um, and those are uh, opportunities to, to make a, a more significant difference than other things that are out there. We've already talked to Duke Energy about their priorities. Now we could fold them into uh, the process. Um, there are also a number of uh, measures from a sustainability standpoint that relate to uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, green spaces, how we treat stormwater, how we treat wastewater. Um, and there are things that are lifestyle oriented. We've talked a lot about micro micromobility. We've talked about increasing the use of uh, or the uh, prevalence of um, uh, bike ridership. Um, we have uh, proposed a, a house car system in our uh, multifamily residential uh, building so that people are, don't feel like they have to buy a car that they use once a week. They can reserve it on their phone and uh, take it out for a couple of hours. Um, so I think we're committed to doing all these things at a macro level all the way down to the day-to-day -day lifestyle micro level. Um, as it relates to public transit, um, it, you know, that's, it, that's an area where there's room to grow for St. Petersburg generally. We're certainly familiar with the BRT station that's coming in, uh, and it, you know, we're going to work uh, aggressively and proactively with the city and the county to make sure that the site is properly served uh, and that uh, uh, we're uh, being the best possible partner in that regard. We also want to make sure that we're providing access to folks who might be working at the TROP, maybe they're living at the TROP and need to get to other parts of town. So uh, there are opportunities, we think, for uh, shuttles and other services that could be offered to residents or workers on the job site to places like South St. Pete where mobility may be a challenge. So uh, those are our thoughts. Anything you want to add, Adam? Yeah. And forgive the mask, but just one more thing. You know, PSTA Route 15 is at one hour headways right now goes up 16th Street. That's one of the things that we can immediately start to work on with PSTAs to get some headways down uh, so that we can better serve things with mass transit. Our proposal also talks about some smart mobility hubs, which would integrate nicely with Michael's smaller parks within the development. Thank you. I knew that was going to be the question to wake everybody up. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh I said I knew this was going to be the question to wake everybody up. <laughs> Here, Jared, yeah. There. yeah, what again, what an opportunity with Sunrunner. Um, our first bus rapid transit in the entire region that connects all the way from Wesley Chapel to the beaches will be constructed next year, right on the front doorstep of First Avenue South, First Avenue North. So that's the first opportunity east-west. But we also talked about what are some of those regional connections north-south? How do we connect, better connect to south, north St. Pete? And it's really a, a lot about having our stations of, of comfort. It's, it's hot in the summer, so how do we have shade? How do we have people, how do we let people feel safe? And we were talking a little bit about this as well right now. You, you can't, can't travel around the site, right? It's, it's, it's just on the exterior. There's a big big parking lot. So now we have the opportunity with these new streets to have other types of transit and micromobility and, and all kinds of other technology internal to the site so that people can get around. Um, who knows where we're going to be in the next 10, 15, 20 years from transportation, but the options continue to grow. So again, I think it's about the east, west, north, south, and then the comfort of our, of our stations. 
Thank you. Good evening. I'm John Gottwald with Osborne Engineering. The, um, the plan that we've prepared you know, identified the, the, the location of our, our intermodal hub where the city has proposed, for, pro, proposed it for in the ISAP plan. But we have a commitment to the community and to the city to make sure that that location is, if that's the, if that's the right spot, we're going to put it there. If there's another uh, spot that's better located, maybe on a, a north-south corridor that's, that's more traveled, uh, maybe a little bit larger area for uh, more of the multimodal uh, opportunities, we'll coordinate that with the city. It's our, our intention to, to make sure that we meet that criteria in its, in, its, in its best ways. But it's not just about the BRT, it's not just about the buses, it's not, not just about uh, the rail if it ever comes. It's about the other uh, mobilities, and I'd like to pass the microphone. So, hi, I'm Liz, and um, part of what our, our Midtown's plan is going to be is to incorporate as much um, transportation, future-proofing future our transportation possibilities. So that includes providing EV chargers, providing, you know, micro-mobility options. Um, we're following the ISAP program and the clean energy program that the city has and um, lo really looking to, to do what we can to um, make sure that the needs of today and the needs of the future are going to be met and, and do that as smartly as possible. All, all these answers have been great and the right answer. And it's kind of something that, you know, when you talk about transportation, talk about mass transit, you know, it's really a regional thing and how do you tie it in. I'm talking to tell you about something that is being done right now. The city of Nashville has approved an autonomous bus system that will travel and it's being developed to travel throughout the city of Nashville. You know, St. Pete being a smart city, that is something that regionally we can integrate in. And it's kind of funny, you know, that they did all these studies of what, what are people comfortable riding in an autonomous bus. And so they have a dummy that sits in the front and it doesn't even, it's not really a real driver, but it makes people feel comfortable. So it's really interesting to see these are being implemented right now. So there's things that we can put in for infrastructure in place to make that happen. And that's really the stuff that we can control as the developers is to put that infrastructure in place for the next five years. So as we work with St. Pete to really make those next steps and smart city steps happen. All right. Thank all you. The, that's all the time for, we have for questions. We, that's all the time we have for questions. Oh, and I was just getting to the real goat now. <laughs> well, thank you so much for answering all the questions. Sorry, we didn't get to all of your questions. I know there's still many more questions to ask about this, and many more questions will be asked in this process. But thank you all for being a part of this as we continue to um, look towards the future of St. Petersburg. Thank you so much again for joining us. And thank you for answering all those questions.